Welcome to the Racially Responsible Podcast. This show is designed to guide, support, and challenge us as white people to be actively anti-racist and step up to work for a racially equitable future. I'm your host, Rory geller Mohammed, a licensed clinical social worker, therapist, and founder of the organization, You Power Change. I'm also a white woman that grew up with a sibling of color, a white mom raising multiracial kids in a multiracial family, and strive to be a role model of what it looks like to be an anti-racist white person. If this resonates with you, I hope you will join the Racially Responsible Podcast community on Facebook to continue the conversation, ask questions, and join us as we support each other on next steps. To creating a racially equitable future, let's get started. Sandy, I want to thank you so much for joining me from this podcast episode. I know you've done amazing work and so many different things, but I'm very familiar with the NASW and the anti-racism work that you've done in New York around that. So I would love if you could take a moment to introduce yourself, share a little bit about yourself, your work, what you do. First of all, Rory, thank you for having me. It's always an opportunity to reach broader bases of people. So I am a social worker. I'm a clinical social worker in New York City and in Westchester County. And I've been a practicing social worker for 40 years. And I did an Undoing Racism workshop 20 years ago. And that changed my life and transformed me and morphed me into an organizer. Because what I understood is that the profession of social work, whatever the profession is, it could be medical profession, it could be schools of education, we address the symptoms of racism without an understanding of the what and the why behind what we see. And so as a social worker, I mean, we exhaust ourselves dealing with issues of homelessness, poverty, health concerns, depression, you know, communities devastated by so many instruments that just sap the life out of them. And without understanding the what and the why, we're like dealing with the symptoms day and night and exhausting ourselves and scratching our heads. Why can't we make a difference? Yes, yes. So when I did that workshop, it was the first time that myself and other social workers really had clarity about the structural arrangements that drive all that we see. And it was clear that all professions basically prepare us to be enablers. We talk about institutional racism, but we're not prepared to number one, see it, and number two, address it. And that started me on a long, long journey. Myself and other social workers job were just feeling a sense of outrage that we had gone to the finest schools of social work and never had this clarity. And many of us were executive directors of organizations, you know, had been working, you know, in the field for years. And then we take this two and a half day workshop and we're like, really? And it was very, very disturbing. And we decided that our profession, social work, really prides itself on being agents of change. And we said, if we're not clear about the change that needs to be made, right, then we should call ourselves agents of change. We should just say that we're enablers and tweakers. (laughs) So we started bringing in faculty from the schools of social work. And what we saw is that, you know, the faculty themselves, I mean, they're part of the system too. They didn't have that clarity. Where would you get it? Seek anti-racism. You have to seek anti-racist education. And so we're deeply grateful to the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. They're celebrating their 40th year this year. They they put millions of people through the Undoing Racism Workshop. It is incalculable, the impact that they've made, because they provide 12 modules. And we all finally, once and for all, we all have the same education. Right, right. And you know, Roar, there's not one profession that doesn't have, you know, like the canons. Like everybody takes social policy. Everybody takes the Constitution. If you're a lawyer, everybody takes, you know, certain courses in, you know, medicine, but nowhere do we offer the same body of knowledge to understand racism. So everybody does their own thing and it just keeps the confusion and it actually enables white supremacy to maintain itself because we get to the root cause and everybody on the same page. So we're really grateful. We started organizing 20 years ago and we're still organizing today. Thousands and thousands and thousands of human service practitioners have gone through the Sun Doing Racism Workshop, you know, social workers, mental health workers, ministers, public sector, you know, people wow. who are there to make a difference. Those right. are the people who come. And that clarity has really advanced the field, has advanced the field because we're talking about racial equity now. And the question is like, what's it going to take to actually change these systems? Right, you know? right. 
it's been really exciting work because I think that we're booming in that yes. area. Like, how do we achieve racial equity? Change the outcomes. So that's that. Ah, no, that's awesome. That's such a powerful story of kind of the impact it had on you and sort of the way that two and a half day not workshop could do so much change in the way that people think and the way that they run organizations and do their work and show up and things. That's, yeah, Great. really that's powerful. Something outrageous about the fact that without that clarity, you're a well-intended person, but you're not really getting to the root cause. You're a exactly. well-intended person. And all of us are well-intended. We all come to our professions, your professions to make a difference, right? But without that analysis, to understand racism, what it is in this country, yeah, and that every system was created in the same way, you know? I, I, I had never dawned on me, you know, like when the constitution was written, those, the, the people for, who came here from England, they had already established all of that was needed before they even had the constitution. We had roads, we had, right. we had hospitals, we had everything here. Yeah. And they came with tremendous knowledge and embedded in that constitution was structural racism, right? Yeah. The first article says, you know, for the purpose of representation and taxation. The Native Americans would not be considered persons at all, but the enslaved Africans would be considered three-fifths of a person. Wow. Bet you embed that in the groundwater, as Joyce James would say, and she's a consultant with the People's Institute. You embed that in the groundwater of a nation contaminates every system. Yeah. And we've been trying to clean up the system ever since, but until you understand that they're all contaminated with that flaw, yeah, that is considered with you know equally right, right. You know, yeah. So just for some context for people, how do you sort of identify racially, ethnically, culturally? How do you describe yourself in those terms? I'm a white woman, and I was born to white parents who immigrated here from Italy. And that's the other thing that happened in the Undoing Racism workshop. You know, I was very, very proud of that story about my parents came here uneducated and had six children. And in one generation, they were able to have all of their children educated. Two of us went to college, the others owned their own homes and they were in professions and everybody was doing well. And I really attributed all of that to the hard work of my parents. You know, and of course they worked hard, but in that workshop, I understood it was built for them. So that when white people came, all they needed to do was to assimilate into this white institutional culture, and then they would have access to all of that. Right. There are people of color who work just as hard today and still cannot achieve that because the system was not, in fact, designed for them. Right. That was such an eye-opening because, I don't know, it just shattered some core belief I had that hard work is what was required to advance. Right, right. You know, and that there was something called pull yourselves up by the boot traps. I mean, I really heard my father say, you work your money, you'll get ahead. And that workshop really made clear that that's not true. Yeah. That are not equal, right? Yeah, for sure. You know, in graduate school, no, I was undergrad when I did social work in undergrad. We had an institutional racism course. And I didn't know at the time that that wasn't something that was mandated across the board. So I was so fortunate to have benefited from a course where the systems were discussed and not recognizing until afterwards then not everybody was receiving that. And still, like, even if we had a whole semester, of course, that's never enough. But, you know, to have that, how fortunate, like, that, that that was part of the curriculum. You know, I took that for granted. Do you know something? In schools of social work, they also mandate that we take institutional racism. But that wasn't the same education that I received from the Undoing Racism Workshop. Wow. I really talk more abstractly about how systems work. You know, it didn't really, like, hit home. Right, right, right. All benefiting. If you're white, you are all benefiting from this system, like my parents did. They right, right. worked hard and they were able to advance. They all benefit. Right. But if you're not white, you're not going to benefit from these systems. They're not designed for you. Right. So the they're other thing that these- often comes up that I was wondering kind of how you help other white people address it, how you've addressed it yourself, any specific sort of situations that maybe to share or around times when you had hard conversations about race and racism in your life, right? maybe personal life, maybe something came up professionally, whatever that is. And so whether it was shame or guilt or anxiety, how you manage that, what that looks like, how you approach those types of things. Well, one thing that I want to say is that there is nothing that's going to shortcut white people doing their own work and feeling super, super comfortable and feeling the esteem and humanity return when you start acknowledging the truth, right? 
So what makes me effective in being with other white people is the fact that I am very, very, very comfortable about it. I don't feel guilt and shame. I feel accountability. You know, we go through, when I first heard about this, I was very guilty. I was very ashamed. And I remember that, mm-hmm. that it's developmental, that people feel that. Right. One of the reasons why we feel so much guilt and shame is because we confuse it very often with the hateful things that have been done, right? Nastiness and the enslavement and just you really want to distance yourself from all that nastiness. But we have to embrace that, right? We produce trauma. Our ancestors came here and produced a lot of trauma. So it's embracing all of that, internalizing all of that. And it was when you realize that the only way out is to be accountable to it and right. start working with other people to change it, right? Right. In that action and in that organizing to change yes. and speaking out, our humanity is restored. And then it, it almost recharges us. And it reinforces, keep doing it. But you have to do your own work. Right. Because very often, if you're not clear yourself, somebody will bring up something. They're always, somebody's always challenging. And if you're not clear, then you'll fumble. And I say, it's okay, fumble. But just keep doing the work to get that clarity. And I never forget that when I first doing anti-racist work, the shame and the guilt was there because I take it personally. But what freed me was understanding that this was something that was done and that white people suffer as well. And that my humanity, right, was impacted. And like I said, my parents immigrated here. And in one generation, I erased all of my Italian heritage. I don't speak Italian. I don't relate to Italian music. And of course, we always like to eat Italian, but anybody can do that. Right. You know that I lost my culture. I lost the language. I had to lose something. Yeah. And in fact, as a child, I remember being embarrassed. My parents were speaking Italian. You know, I'd be embarrassed with the school lunches that I would bring to school. So that's the price that we pay for racism, right? If you want to be white, you have to assimilate. I remember my mother, she would speak to me in Italian and ask me to, to respond in English because she understood the power of assimilation. Right. That's the price that we pay, that we lose our culture, we lose our humanity, that we look at things that are wrong and we use denial and justification in order to keep going, but it's only because we don't know what else to do. Right. Anti-racism is liberatory, helps us to understand that all things are not equal, fault, we're accountable, and collectively we can do something. Restore culture, restore respect for people's culture. That, you know, this white culture that dominates is dehumanizing. You know, what would happen if we had a dominant culture that was inclusive? What would happen if we had a dominant culture that was respected? You know, I hear day in and day out, we do anti-racist work that people of color who work in white institutional culture have stress hormones off the charts constantly, that it's so difficult to work and live in the disrespect that white institutional culture and the values that white institutional culture impose and the people who are gatekeepers to that, you know, the people who evaluate and judge and, you know, do we realize that, you know, this white supremacy is destructive and to work towards decentering that. And I love that, you know, the work that you do is like, you know, working with multiracial families. Wow, that's where the hope is, right? <laughs> that's where the hope is. Yeah. yeah. If we have equity. Yes. And they're not always, you know, multiracial because they're compared to white families. Right, right, right for sure. I would love to hear also, in all, you've done so much organizing work when kind of like what the process was getting started when, you, you know, having, being able to bring so many of these workshops to so many people. How did that look? Like, how did you get actually do that? Make that happen? Right. Well, the first one is always like giving birth. <laughs> the first one is always the hardest one because what you're trying to do is to bring people. You need at least 35 people to come to a workshop and organize your first workshop is difficult because everybody has a reason to not do it. Yes. Oh, I'm not racist. Oh, I've been black all my life. Oh, I write books on race critical theory. You know, there's many, many reasons I can't give up two and a half days of my time. I don't have $350. And can you imagine that? So there are many, many reasons because people want to avoid it, right? Yeah. Hardest part is really sharing with people, you know, why we need to do this and just how it restores the humanity. And so we started with our friends, 
we started with just bringing our friends together, wow. our colleagues together, and getting a small grant from NASW and just saying, you know, we just have to do this. I've been sharing our story. I would go around telling people I did this workshop and this is what I learned. And, you know, I was the executive director of, you know, the Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence, and I didn't know this. And we can do this. And then those people would say, yes, we need to do another workshop. And then they would bring more people and more people. But we made a commitment that we would bring people through the Undoing Racism workshop so that we had a common language, a common analysis, and a common understanding that would allow us to improve the way we were working collaboratively. Because I don't know if you have this experience, but whenever we talk about race, it starts getting heated. Yes. And, right? Mm-hmm. And feed it because everybody has their own idea about what it is in their own painful experience. But after the Undoing Racism workshop, we understand, ah, it's historical, it's structural, and, you know, it needs to work on that. It allowed us to move forward. Yeah. Some progress without being reactive. Yes. Oh, God, it was just so wonderful to be able to move forward. So all of our effort went into getting people into the workshop so that we could do the work after the workshop. Right. Oh. We have an anti-racist alliance as an organizing arm in the New York City area of the People's Institute's work. So we were like the anti-racist alliance of social workers. It's just the anti-racist alliance. If you look at our calendar today, we have like 25, 30 monthly meetings. Wow. This is what we give birth to. People say, you know, I want to talk about undoing racism and child welfare. So they start that. How about undoing racism for white people? We have that. And then we have regional networks. We have this huge network, thousands and thousands of people. Of course, not everybody comes to these meetings and it doesn't take everybody, right? But we have this network of people who, I don't know, have a shared vision, you know, that we can change the outcomes. Yes. We can change the outcomes if we change the way we do business. So anybody can go to the antiracistalliance.com website. It's a resource for everybody. We have monthly meetings, you know, we have workshops listed there, but the people has an undoingracism.org website or the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. And you can see that there's a national calendar and it all starts with that basic education that gives us a common language, common history, and a common analysis so that we're all on the same page. So have a parent group do that. We've had parents do that. Parent groups do it at school. Educators do it healthcare, nurses, you know, because what the point is, is that after you do this workshop, you turn the mirror inward and you start looking at your own discipline, your own work. So you're not out there like fixing people. You're looking at, oh, how is social work maintaining white supremacy? How is social work, you know, keeping people, black leadership out? How are we excluding, you know, oh, how are we using parenting models that really are exclusive and harmful, right? Yeah, no, it's an amazing workshop. I mean, I had taken initially in, I think, like 2005 in New York at the time. I remember also getting, I worked in high school, so being able to try to get the principal to let some of the teachers go to take the workshop. And moving down to Florida, they have the, uh, the Racial Equity Institute. I know is connected and such a partner with them that they've worked with and are starting to do it down here. Yeah, it's an amazing thing to see the change that can happen when people are participating in this type of workshop, for sure. The Racial Equity Institute is not a partner, so it does something okay. different. Okay. But yes, the Undoing Racism workshop is also down in Florida. Okay. Yeah. They mentioned the People's Institute, so maybe they learned from the People's Institute, I yeah. think. I know they have mentioned it during the workshop, so that's interesting, yes. I really don't know what the content is. Okay. It's the common analysis, those exact 12 modules that are delivered that allows us to move forward. Yes. So when you say the racial equity is something else, there are many, many organizations that People's Institute gave birth to. Yes. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's the same thing. So I really can't tell okay. you. Either. Okay. So last question before we finish up, for people who are maybe listening, what would be like one tip, one step forward that they could take? Start reading, start learning. And when I started organizing, I said that I was going to do something every day for undoing racism. And it could just be reading my newspaper, reading my book, whatever, but noticing what's not there. Just do something every day for undoing racism. And so you just like put on a pair of glasses and start your journey because becoming anti racism is the most exciting journey 
of our lives. And you won't know that until you actually begin to accumulate power. And it happens just like if we're going to work out, if we're going to, whatever it is, you know, you need discipline. So do something every day for humanity. And you can look at magazines, you can look at your children's books. Just as one example, okay? I was looking down at somebody's little homework assignment, and it was at a church, and a little girl had this little thing on her uh, cue, and it said, Jesus loves the little children of the world. And I looked down, and guess what I saw? I saw all the children of the world, but there was one color that was missing, and it was the black child. Wow. Can you believe that? 2020, and this is what I saw. And so I'm making note of that. And so I spoke to somebody at that church. I went over and I said, by the way, who's in charge of education? That was what I did that day. And not to shame anybody, but to just probably didn't notice that, you know, but that's something that, you know, want to be cognizant of who's missing. Right. Volume. So do something every day, fill that anti-racist muscle, you know, start that journey and just be ready for the liberation that comes with the aliveness that comes and the humanity that comes when we make a commitment to do the right thing. And this is definitely the right thing. Thank you so, so much, Sandy. This has been wonderful. It's been wonderful chatting with you. Thank you so much for this opportunity, okay? And I can't wait to hear the podcast. Awesome. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of the Racially Responsible Podcast. I hope you participate in our Facebook group to continue the conversation, share your thoughts, ask questions, and suggest future topics you would like to hear discussed on the show. I'd like to end each episode with encouraging each of us to think about one action step, small or big, that we could take today to help us move in the direction of creating a racially equitable future. If you feel comfortable, share your action step in our Facebook group to inspire and encourage others and receive support because we know action steps aren't always easy. Don't forget to check out the show notes and I hope you join us for our next episode. Until next time.